There are some unique challenges to bringing well-known horror icons uh, into a game. Oh man, what was my first experience with the Texas Chainsaw film? My first experience with uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, probably very uncommon compared to what most people did. I saw that film when I was eight or nine years old. The first time I saw the Texas Chainsaw Massacre film, well, I was in college and I was hanging with a bunch of folks who loved like classic film. So way, way too young to be watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but, but like a lot of kids growing up in the 80s, you know, that's what we did. We got a VCR and we went to the video store and we were renting Friday the 13th and Halloween. And one day, you know, one of, a friend of mine who was a much older got a hold of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And um, you know, at the time, I think, obviously as a, a young kid, you don't know the ramifications of watching that film and, and what that film did for the industry. And it wasn't until many years later when I was taking film class and film study that uh, that film came up again uh, as something that not only changed the horror genre, but just changed the film industry in general. First time I saw this movie, it was really, I thought it was super violent. It's like, oh, that's kind of weird, I don't like that. But then actually watching it and thinking about it, like, you know, actually there wasn't blood. It wasn't that violent, it's just very disturbing. And I couldn't get it out of my head. And I had to watch it again. And I had to watch it again and again. And each time I picked up something like, wow, these characters are strange and there's a dark humor in it, but still it's sadistic. And I just fell in love with it. The original 74 film, I feel like I saw that when I was younger and I, I don't think I fully understood what I was seeing. And it wasn't until, it was either my junior or senior year of high school that I really started to go like, oh, and then a rewatch again in college uh, really, really drove it home for me as like, There's, this is something special. This is a special film. <laughs> I'd say my experience working on uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is there's really two um, angles there. There's the creative side where you're thrilled and, and you're thrilled to be working on such a franchise that you love, that you grew up watching, just like we did with Friday the 13th. Now we're doing the same thing for Texas. So as a fan, that's awesome to be able to work on it on the creative side and to work with Sumo Digital and everyone here. But there's also kind of the nerd side where I get to call Kim Hinkle and I get to work with the rights holders and text them or go to their house in Texas and pick their brain about um, what was present at the time when they were filming that movie. For, for a video game, obviously, you need more than the cook, the hitchhiker, and Leatherface for a multiplayer match. So we knew we needed some new characters. So part of the process of creating characters for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre involves speaking with Kim Hinkle, the original rights holder. He's been pivotal in giving us access to designs that he's got from way back when for other characters that would have been in the universe. To work with Kim Hinkle on this uh, is really a dream because a lot of these franchises, a lot of these iconic horror IPs, the original creators may not be attached anymore. They may not still be with us. And if you don't have that voice in the mix, something's missing in my opinion. So. It's been, an, it's been a dream to have him be it, not only attached, but like in the trenches with us. The process was, was a long one. It was probably three years of, of just research and um, studying certain things. We knew we wanted the family, the, the new characters to fit into the family, but also stand out. There's a, th there's a fine line there where they can look out of place, but they also have to have a personality and they have to blend in in a way that you would believe that they could live there. When we were creating new characters for this game, we, uh, we had the t two, two types. We had the family, we had the victims. For the family, we had these brilliant buyers that Gunn had been working with Kim Hankel, the original writer of the film, on. I think Sissies is probably one of my, my favourite ones, just because she's um, this kind of after effect of the 1960s uh, kind of like hippie movement and stuff, uh, but she's gone to a much more extreme ends um, and going falling into like cults and all this kind of stuff so I quite like her personality and her kind of uh, uh, her kind of psychosis I guess for lack of a better phrase so yeah I quite like Sissy's background for always is always forever cause one is one is one look inside yourself or your father all is one all is none, all is none, none is one.
Sissy Sunshine Slaughter um, was what Kim came up with. And he had this paragraph about Sissy. That's all he had was this a paragraph about this girl, this kind of crazed LSD 60s kind of drifter girl who rebelled against the family and, and hitchhiked across the country and went to just a lot of different places. She ended up with the Manson family for a while and she bounced around and she left a trail of carnage kind of everywhere she went. So Johnny uh, is the, the pretty boy character. So he's like the sort of almost James Dean rebel without a cause. He's got a, a, a very beautiful, handsome face uh, that sort of lures the ladies in, but there's a sort of, you know, something about his eyes that is dangerous. For Johnny, that was an interesting character because he was brand new from scratch. And I told Kim and I talked to Kim that I felt like I needed a, a, a male that would not fit in with the family. So we didn't want to do an older gentleman like the cook. We didn't want another wily, erratic, lanky character like the hitchhiker. Um, obviously, we didn't want another grandpa. And we didn't want another brute like Leatherface. So within that small gap, there's only a few characters that can fit in there. So she, over the course of three years, I studied just serial killers and went down that whole rabbit hole of a lot of the famous ones like Ted Bundy and Richard Ramirez, but also a lot of unknown ones as well. Um, just went into that rabbit hole of what motivates them. What do they look like? Um, how do they use their looks to get close to people and how do they manipulate them and all these things. And that's where Johnny kind of came from is he's this weird mixture of a lot of serial killers who's able to go out from the house and go to small towns and drift around and hang out and he can stalk people and he gets, you know, he uses his looks to get close to them and then he can lure them back to the family house. Because he's not just doing it because he wants food, right? He's doing it because he's sadistic. Um, he's the closest thing the family has to a real serial killer. So those two characters bring a lot of personality to what normally would be just this highly dysfunctional circle of the cook, the hitchhiker, and Leatherface. <laughs> You know, the, the chainsaw from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is as much a character as Leatherface um, or the cook or the hitchhiker or grandpa, you know, because it's, it's right there in the title, but more than that, it just, the sound of it, the look of it, the menace. You know, there's this great scene in the movie where um, the chainsaw is just sitting on the table and you know Leatherface is going to reach for it and something horrible is going to happen. that implied moment of what you know is happening to the characters because he started that up, it just, it, 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 it really is just what drives home, you know, the horror of that title, the horror of the film. And so we knew that the chainsaw had to be, we had to approach it with as much care as we approached any individual character in the game. When you see Leatherface without that chainsaw, he loses something. As cool as it is to see him use the hammer and kill Kirk or something like that, that chainsaw is, might as well be a part of him. Might as well be part of his mask or his clothes. So we knew that that chainsaw had to be represented perfectly or as close as you can get. And luckily we, you know, Ish here and Mad and, and Ben took time to scan the real saw that we found. We have four or five saws here, Poulons. It, it, was, an, it was interesting. It was a lot of, um, um, you know, speaking to, to older uh, repair people that have, you know, 40 plus years experience fixing chainsaws this old. Um, so that, it was interesting to go down those roads with those folks, but it allowed us to be able to get a chainsaw running, uh, a couple of them to be able to do all the, the, the capture that we need to do. So it, it definitely was like trying to get a character up off the ground, like something that you're building from the ground up because none of them worked. So you get to see the the bits and pieces in the insides of that thing to get it running again. But uh, it was definitely worth it. What's important is not just whether it's a 306 or a 245 or a hybrid. What we wanted to do was capture it the way it looked like in the film, right? Because really no one knows if it was in 1971 or 1972 or three or four. It's not a lot of info on something that was 50 years ago. So our goal was to look at it in the film, get as much reference as we could, scan the real saws that we have, try to get that saw as close as you can. We wouldn't normally do that for a lot of other weapons. To nail the authenticity of this saw, well, I mean, my focus is always about sound. It's just a thing I, I really enjoy. And I knew I only trusted one guy to help me with that, and that's Watson Wu. 
Hi, my name is Watson Wu. I am a sound designer, sound effects recording artist. He's one of the best out there. He's done a lot of, uh, of the racing franchises and games that people know about. And, uh, and I knew that we had a unique problem because that, that, sound, that saw is really loud and you need uh, specific equipment to capture that. And I knew he had captured very loud vehicles and very loud weaponry and he had the, the tech to do it and the know-how to do it. Yeah, the, the chainsaw was, and probably still is, the, the biggest overall sound design challenge of the game. It, I mean, it's, the, it's the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The chainsaw had to sound awesome, and Gunn, quite rightly, really, really pushed to make sure we got as much quality and authenticity of the, into the sound of the chainsaw as we can. We started off, uh, importantly, with them actually sourcing the exact model chainsaw from the film. So we had a 1970s Poland chainsaw, which they then took out into a field um, with a Watson Wu. It's one of the world's finest field recording experts. And they just spent the day thrashing it around and um, uh, having a, a big guy walking around and just getting a sense of it. And I gave them a huge shopping list of every sound I'd possibly want out of it. And they just obliged and gave me this massive recordings that I could work with. Uh, so it was great that we could bring him on to, to help us get exactly what we were after. But it, it, we got to go even further with that in that the types of equipment he brought not only could handle it, but also handle it in a full range of dynamic sound, which allowed us to get great source material to hand off to Ross uh, to bring that into the sound design of the game and being able to have a discussion with our partners at Dolby to start introducing Atmos into this game, which it might be one of the first, if not the first, horror multiplayer games that has Dolby Atmos uh, within the game. So then, after that really, the, the, the thing we had to think about was, did we want to have a canned chainsaw sound that you, you sort of press a button and a pre-made sound plays? Or did we want to go a little deeper and do something quite complicated and replicate an actual chainsaw engine? Um, it felt like it'd be a, a letdown to the fans not to have what felt like a real, actual chainsaw. <laughs> so that's what we did in the end. We built basically a replicated engine for the chainsaw, like you would for an engine for a car in a game, with, um, with uh, revving and throttle on, throttle off, and curves of, of acceleration, deceleration. So uh, I had to take uh, loads of little clips of loops of the uh, chainsaw at different uh, RPM speeds and then layer it up and merge it all together so that it's a genuine, real, live chainsaw system. So when you rev it in game now, you're not hearing some you know, lame, canned sound that just plays again and again. It actually does throttle up and throttle down and you get real rev. So you can run around like, and it's, it's just so tactile and fun to play because you're, you're as you're playing, you're just pressing up throttles, rum, 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 and you actually feel so much like Leatherface. So it's, uh, it's been incredibly difficult and challenging, but in the best possible way. I mean, that sort of challenge is a, a pleasure to try and find an answer to and sounds badass in game now. I mean, everyone knows that sound is very important in a horror game, but you, you need to know what you're doing. You gotta have a, a maestro behind the scenes doing it. And luckily we had Watson for the capture and we got Ross to drive it home. A character's backstory can inform design, but also a character's design can inform backstory. All right, when you're creating characters for video games, you know, there's this push and pull between the needs of the game uh, and the needs for narrative. And, you know, you kind of go back and forth. There's something about creating uh, characters for a horror game, um, because there's so many tropes, there's so many character archetypes, there's so many things that you expect to see from those characters that people are used to within the world of horror. and then. To take that a step further within the world of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, we had these specific character types that we wanted to bring in. We were still designing the game. We were still designing how these characters would exist within this world, what their strengths would be, uh, how they would play. Um, so we started kind of going back and forth between here are some of the strengths we want to bring in, here are some of the games, gameplay styles we want to bring in, you know, and, and marrying that to these these archetypes, these kind of characters that you expect to see in these films. We take Leland, for example. Back in high school, he was part of the wrestling team. Waned away a bit when he moved into college, 
But that strength and agility that he has forms kind of his attributes within the game. So he has high levels of strength and also his actual special ability allows him to barge into, um, into family members and knock them down. <laughs> We've also got Julie who kind of grew up in California around the beaches and surfing, a lot more sporty lifestyle. She's got much better stamina attribute which allows her to move around the level much more agile and avoid detection by the family. You know, you kind of go back and forth. Um, you never are fully invested completely in a backstory or fully invested in a gameplay style. They both are kind of existing loosely, almost disconnected to some degree, until you start to realize, hey, this character that we've created, they really fit with this gameplay style. You know, now let's take that a step further and think about a deeper way to play them. Think about more about how that'll inform their visuals, more about their dialogue, more about then some of that little, you know, seasoning that we can throw on that character as well. And, you know, it's one of those things of you steadily arrive, both design, gameplay, and narrative, they kind of start to meet in the middle until finally you have this fully fleshed out character. And I think what's really interesting about that is because in some ways, you then know that character on a much deeper level than if you just tackled one or the other in a vacuum. But well, having a bit of context about the, the character's personality, the kind of character traits, are they, are they timid, are they outgoing, are they confident, um, are they aggressive, all, all those kind of traits. They're really useful for putting that into the design and trying to think about the, the personality of who you're trying to create. Um, and this, this is going to sound like a bad thing, but basically when I'm designing something, my mind tends to wander. And But when, when it's wandering, I'm trying to think about that character and trying to think about their background and trying to think about the personality and how you can try and inject that into the design because it does come through. Um, so yeah, the, the background of the character is quite important when it comes to designing. We wanted to make sure the player knew, why are these characters here? Um, we didn't want just a bunch of random victims showing up and then you spawn in the basement with no backstory, right? So we started to fill in the gap with, okay, who are our main characters and what are they doing and how does the family come in touch with them? How do they get kidnapped? Where were they at when this happened? Those are all important pieces for us when you create a story. Um, that's why we settled on this story of Anna and Maria um, and incorporated a lot of things that make Texas, Texas, like the sunflower season, like the wildflower season, and this art student who's out just finally breaking away from her home and going to college, and then she's out taking pictures of the blue bonnets and the paintbrush and all these awesome flowers, and she gets caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. That, that gave us a reason and, and, and put her in a location that was close to the family, to one of our new characters. So without all that, you really don't know as a player why you're playing and, and who these characters are. So really, a lot of that backstory um, was important for us to ground the characters into a timeline within the franchise. And also, honestly, if, if you think about it, it's hard for you to care about a character if you don't know anything about them. The thing is, because we're facing our fears in horror films, you know, we're facing these things that terrify us, the way the characters then react to them, it's, it's kind of the surrogate for us. It's mimicking how, how should we approach these? How can we overcome them? How can we face these things that are, you know, we find terrifying, whether on an individual level or family level, or fear about society as a whole? And I think, you know, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it, it, it's really good about doing that because, you know, there's these undercurrents of, you know, economic despair and economic disparity and, you know, rural versus, you know, uh, uh, urban um, and about, you know, people, outsiders coming into these very, you know, kind of enclosed, like isolated communities as well. And I think a lot of this stuff just gets layered on in the film, but gets layered on in a lot of horror movies. You know, you can... If you want to watch a, movie, a horror movie at the surface level and just enjoy the gore, enjoy the blood, enjoy the screams, you totally can. And it's a great time. That's one of that's the best way to watch horror movies. You know, that's you just get the popcorn and, and start screaming. But you know, I mean, there's a lot of people that analyze horror and analyze the characters of horror as thinking about the manifestations of our fears as society and individuals. And I think there's. If you approach horror that way, you'll start to realize how smart and how intelligent and how really like meaningful so much horror is. And a lot of people just never, never get past that surface level. For me, hopefully 
everyone sees all the hard work that we put into this game and, and all the effort that it takes on our half here at Gun Interactive and at Sumo Digital to take a film that's so old and to recreate that in digital form for people to play with their friends and experience like the movie kind of all over again. Um, hopefully everyone loves uh, the game and what we're doing and we look forward to letting everybody play it soon.